At 3 a.m. on Christmas morning, 1999, 26-year-old Layson Kennard was standing at the counter of a 24-hour hamburger stand on Rosecrans and Lamoli Avenues in the LA-adjacent city of Hawthorne in California, when an unknown assailant walked up behind him, stood a few feet away, and fired multiple gunshots into Kennard's back, hands, and wrists. Kennard fell to the ground and stayed there until he was taken to Harbor UCLA Medical Center in Torrance, where doctors declared him dead. Police theorized it was probably a gang-related murder, one of 10,104 LA County killings attributed to gang violence between 1980 and 2000. When Kennard was killed, his outfit provided a clue to his gang ties. He was wearing a blue denim shirt, Pele Pele trousers, and a bright blue Dada Supreme t-shirt, size triple XL. To the world, Layson Kennard was known as Big Freeze, a rapper who banded together with other Crip gang members to form a musical group that gained notoriety for its hard-hitting West Coast beats and rhymes, but also because of its impeccable authenticity in a genre that judges not just the music, but the truth behind it. They were known as the Nationwide Rip Riders, and along with their counterparts in the Bloods, the Damu Riders, they had put together a series of albums that did something no one else was able to accomplish. The 1990s were a time where rappers had more creative liberty to be themselves and still find their audience without as many outside pressures from the music industry to conform. The Billboard charts were full of albums with socially conscious songs, so-called gangster rap, romance, and as well as oddballs who found their niche by being comedic. But it was also a decade that saw a surge of artists who came directly from the streets to the recording studio, starting with the world-famous anthem Fuck the Police by N.W.A., which proved that artists could receive backing of major corporations and become commercially successful even while angering politicians and even the FBI. But if major label-signed rappers like Easy e DJ Quick, Tupac, the South Central Cartel, and others were blurring the lines between the streets and mainstream America, the nationwide Rip Riders and Demu Riders did away with these pretenses completely. They were legitimate, unabashed gang members who flouted their affiliations to such a degree that it almost didn't seem real that they would be rapping. The cover of the Nationwide Rip Riders' self-titled debut album was released in a clear blue plastic case and depicted a large group of Crips posing in a yard while holding firearms and an axe and throwing up gang signs. It wasn't the least bit commercial. Therein lied the genius. Listeners who were from that lifestyle could tell that it was authentic. And those who weren't could buy the record and feel like that they were looking through a portal into a secret world that otherwise wouldn't be accessible. And the strategy worked. Despite being distributed through an independent label and the lack of radio play and commercials, the Nationwide Rip Riders albums charted on Billboard, reaching top 50 overall and top 10 heat seekers in the aptly titled 1993 release Bangin' on Wax, a collaboration with the Damu Riders, went on to sell more than 500,000 copies, passing the threshold for a gold record plaque. Somehow, in the wake of the golden age of hip-hop, these two groups were able to take advantage of the public's desire for truly authentic music without compromising their roots. Adding to the surreal feeling, the album was comprised of songs where Bloods and Crips would say disparaging things about the other side on the same track, simultaneously inflaming gang rivalries while proving that peace was possible between opposing gangs. But when it comes to music about gangsters, whether it's gangster rap or corridos about drug cartels, authenticity can bring tragedy. Over the years, members of both groups fell prey to the streets at an alarming rate, and homicide was the most common cause. Six members of the Demu Riders were victims of fatal violence, some in high-profile cases that were directly attributable to rivalries between the Bloods and the Crips. The fate of the Nationwide Rip Riders members while equally tragic, has remained more of a mystery, with rumors and speculation rampant online. That's what we'll be focusing on in this video. After months of research, many questions remain unanswered, but we'll tell you what we found out, what remains unknown, and what facts remain in dispute in the history of what was arguably rap's realist group of the 1990s. But first, here's a brief history of the nationwide Rip Riders. 
All told, more than a dozen different people were considered members, and several neighborhoods were represented, including the Fudgetown Mafia Crips, Kelly Park Compton Crips, Atlantic Drive Compton Crips, Watts Franklin Crips, and the Avalon Gangsta Crips. It all started with the formation of the Bloods and Crips rap group, which was more or less the brainchild of a man named Ronnie Phillips, a Southern California native who garnered respect from both red and blue. Phillips co-founded Dangerous Records, the label that would put out the Bloods and Crips albums, and he credited one of the nationwide rip writers, Tweety Bird Loke, with being instrumental to the foundation. As Bronco, one member of the Nationwide Rip Riders would later recall, recording albums together would give both sides a newfound respect for one another. Of course, after their initial collaborations, the two sides split off into their respective groups, and there was always a hint of competition to see whether the Bloods or the Crips would sell the most. The Nationwide Rip Riders debut was released on September 26, 1995, and it took four years for them to release a less successful sequel entitled Betrayed can't trust nobody. But two years before the release of their second album, one of the group's most popular members, AWOL, aka Donald Lavelle Stallworth, died on July 4th, 1997, at the age of 21. Details of his death are murky at best, but two narratives have come out. Multiple online blogs say that AWOL was killed by a police officer. But a story from the North County Times tells a slightly different story. It says that a man identified as AWOL had died in a police holding cell in San Diego County from a, quote, apparent cocaine overdose. The newspaper reported that on July 3rd at one minute before midnight. AWOL was arrested in Oceanside on suspicion of selling crack cocaine and possessing a 9mm pistol. Police denied that he ever resisted arrest and say that he was booked into a holding cell at the station, where he spent roughly 30 minutes before he was found unconscious. Police theorized that he had ingested drugs to avoid being charged with possession, but also conceded that an autopsy hadn't been conducted and the results of blood tests would not be available for weeks. It appears that the newspaper never followed up on AWOL's death, which was ultimately ruled an accident. Two years later, Big Freeze was gunned down at the hamburger stand on Christmas. Police never announced any arrests. On November 1st, 2003, The man behind Dangerous Records, Ronnie Phillips, died of an undiagnosed heart problem at his home in Van Nuys. He had reportedly complained of flu-like symptoms before his death, and when his phone abruptly disconnected during a call with his sister, paramedics were called to the residence. They found him deceased in his bathroom. Next, in 2012, James Kelly, aka BG Scarface, died of a suicide in Spokane, Washington. We won't dwell on his passing due to its circumstances, other than to say that anyone who experiences suicidal thoughts or ideation should contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by texting or calling 988. And that there's a litany of interviews and articles by surviving suicide victims who've said that they've regretted their attempt the instance they made it. On April 3rd, 2020, Tweety Bird Loke died of a heart attack according to multiple posts by family members and loved ones. Born Richard Johnson, Tweety Bird Loke was instrumental in the foundation of the Bloods and Crips group and the nationwide Rip Riders, and was also a childhood friend of Easy e He was also known for frequently dissing mainstream rappers during his solo career. Ronnie Phillips went out of his way to give Tweety Bird Loke credit for playing a key role in the start of Dangerous Records, and he's listed as a producer in the nationwide Rip Riders' first album. On November 9th, 2020, Nationwide Rip Riders member Todd Steele, aka Six Pack, was pronounced dead at Antelope Valley Hospital in Lancaster after complaining of several serious medical maladies. When his autopsy started and the pathologist discovered bullet fragments and evidence of a prior gunshot wound in his back, decades earlier, Six Pack had survived a shooting and even spoke about it during a documentary about the Bloods and Crips rap group during the 1990s. Over time, he'd complained about pain and other complications from the bullet fragments that remained very close to his spine. And when it was discovered during the autopsy that he was missing a kidney, doctors initially believed he'd undergone surgery, leading to the removal of a kidney that caused a fatal medical condition. If that had been true, it would have meant that the shooting was the proximate cause of his death. 
But it turned out that he'd simply been born missing a kidney, and the coroner declared Sixpack had died of natural causes. The pathologist also noted several tattoos that alluded to his days as a gangster and a rapper, including one that read, Insane Sixpack. He was 50 years old. With all of that having been said, we were unable to ascertain anything about the fate of Mac-11, who is deceased according to several online posts, as well as kool If anyone knows anything about what became of these two Los Angeles rap luminaries, please drop a comment. On a brighter note, at least six of the members are confirmed alive, and several continue to put out music to this day. G-Bone is still putting out music and is active on social media under the stage name Gangsta Bone, and Bronco is still recording songs too, including one notable single entitled Same Team, alongside Damu Rida's rapper June Dog. On the song and the video, the two repeat a hook, Red and Blue Make Green, preaching the same unity that their respective groups exemplified by working together on two Los Angeles classics in the 1990s.